Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. Is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Mike Wardia, and you are watching the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. And you are a machine. You write books. As a matter of fact, <laughs> when you were on the show, just to, I mean, it seems like just a few weeks ago, really, uh-huh. was, you, you had uh, finished up another book. Right. And you're like, and, I, and the other one's on the way. And, and here it is, Danger <laughs> Forward, written by Mike Guardia. And it's about this general named Paul F. Foreman. And you guys can get that. Here's the link for that book if you guys decide to get it. Uh, Mike always comes on because you write incredible things. You take these people that we ought to know about or these units or these battles or whatever it is. And you're like, this is interesting. And so you're this, um, I don't know, how would you care? I mean, okay, historian, author, great. But right. how do you characterize what it is that you do? Because you fill a very specific, and as far as I can tell, undiscovered niche. Right. So really what I try to do, I think if I found a word to describe myself, it would be historian slash storyteller. Okay. Um, be, because really what I want to try and do is I want to try and take some of the broader themes of history and put it against the backdrop of what the human element is. And I want to tell, I, I really want to tell these narratives that are driven by the human element, where it, where you're hearing it directly from the source and really just showing and painting a broad picture of what the spirit of man can accomplish when the chips are down and the odds are stacked against you. And, uh, you know, how these, uh, how these historical narratives play into the personal fabric of the lives of the people who are making them happen. So, yeah. You pick interesting topics too. Uh, one of them was a tank battle in Iraq and the unit uh-huh. you know, they're in and tank battles just don't happen very often. So these right. are like, at least for now, uh-huh. the uh the last dying embers of these things but it's still it's a tank battle so it's exciting yeah. and shooting down migs and air-to-air combat even if it was a short thing and kind of closing out an era it still needs to be told why is it those stories that interest you so much well you know i think in a lot of ways these stories tend to find me you know i tend to try and gravitate towards any narrative that i think has a compelling nature to it you know, one that really highlights, hey, here's something that happened in history. And it was unique because it happened at the tail end of one era. And it was also the dawn of another era. And, you know, if I can, uh, you know, if I can uh, talk to somebody or if I can, uh, if I can, if, if I can find a connection with someone who either has been at that particular point in time or who knows somebody who has been, it's like, yeah, it's like, OK, well, I want to take that story and I want to show the broader public, you know, what has happened and what were all of those li- li- little metaphysical tidbits that happened to, you know, make it such an important, uh, an, an important transitional junction in history. Yeah, yeah no, I get that. Yeah. Wait, so you have Paul Gorman here. Right. Uh, how did he drop into your lap? All righty. So let's see. Uh, if we wind the clocks back to about 2014, I think that's when I first came across the name Paul Gorman. And I actually um, I actually came across his name when I was researching the book that I wrote on Don Starry. And uh, and Paul Gorman's name uh, popped out among the many intellectual giants that I discovered who played a role in rebuilding the army in the wake of the post-Vietnam malaise. And, uh, you know, I, I was fascinated by a lot of the things that he did when he was with the U.S. Army's Training and Doctrine Command, but I never bothered to dig any deeper uh, as to what he did beyond those handful of years that he was with TRADOC. And fast forward to about 2018, uh, when I was doing a presentation at the Colin Powell Leadership Academy in Minneapolis, you know, the professor of military science, he said, Mike, I read your book on Crusader. I read your book on Don Starry let me ask you something. Have you ever heard of Paul Gorman? And I said, yeah, you know, matter of fact, I, uh, I, I very distinctly remember his name uh, because, you know, I came across it as I was doing the research for Crusader. And he said, well, Mike, you know, it, there's so much more that he did beyond his role at TRADOC. Let me tell you about a few of the things that he's accomplished in his lifetime. And then he went through the entire narrative to say, okay, well, here is 
1950 West Point graduate. Okay. And he fought in the hilltop battles of North Korea. Then he was also the commander of American forces at Bong Trang. And not only that, you know, he stayed in the military after the war. You know, he did all these great things with TRADOC. He was the commander of Southcom when we were actively supporting the Contras in Nicaragua. And he also served on the Paris Peace Delegation and was the principal architect of the infamous Pentagon Papers. And I'm just, I'm, and I'm taking this all in and I'm thinking to myself, wow, how come I never heard about any of that? I, I got to meet this guy and I got to write this book. Yeah. And, and is, is, uh, is he still with us? The he is. He is. As a matter of fact, just this year, he turned 94 and and uh, he is just sharp as a tack. I mean, he, he is healthy as a horse and uh, he's, he's uh, still living his best life. I love it. There's a there's this whole um, the Korea era vets, you know, right. whether they served in World War Two and then hung around for I mean, not long at all. Right. Like five uh-huh. years. Uh-huh. All of a sudden they're redeployed into another nasty fight. But we don't get that. We don't have uh, Vietnam has a lot of passion around it. World War II, for sure. It's the greatest story in human history, basically. But why is it that Korea kind of falls by the wayside? Why do people like Paul who don't do all these incredible things? Why does it take so long for them to get recognized? Well, I think in a lot of ways, they tend to call Korea the forgotten war because it really found itself sandwiched in between two very passionate conflicts. You know, it, it's, it's pretty much, as you said, on the one, uh, you know, it, it's pretty much between the two bookends of World War II and Vietnam. Now, on the one end, you have World War II, which is really a go-to for all people who are interested in military history. And I think it's pretty much like you said, World War II, that is the greatest story in human history, you know, of how we took the most destructive conflict ever and used it to defeat the forces of fascism. And then on the other hand, you have what was probably the most catastrophic war effort in American, uh, in, in American history to that point. And, you know, you have on one end with World War II, a lot of, uh, a lot of lingering positive feelings, but then on Vietnam, you have a completely different story where there's a lot of resentment. So when you have those two competing emotions on either side of the uh, geopolitical spectrum, the conflict in the middle that tends to get forgotten is Korea. And it's like, okay, well, Korea, that was three years. We didn't really call it a war. It was a police action and it ended in a draw. Both sides claimed victory. Uh, We went back to the status quo antebellum. And when those veterans came home, they were pretty much ignored. And uh, yeah, I think really it just gets lost in that metaphysical shuffle there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. And then someone, well, someone like Paul, who grows up, he's a teenager during World War II. His his brain is fully on. He understands what's happening. Uh, Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, graduating in 50, he is fully aware of the Korean conflict. It sounds like he goes, goes to other conflicts, goes to Vietnam. His his entire life, he's known this, this war pace. Mm -hmm. And then we go into the, and I'll, I'll call it a lull because there were no, you know, major deployments. I mean, sure, we had Grenada and, and South America, but how does a guy like that transition properly into something else besides just these multinational deployments where we go and, and trench up and shoot? Well, for him, I think it was a chore, but he told himself, okay, well, if we're not actually trading bullets and we're not actually trading bombs, then the onus is on me to try and find a construct where we are handling these national security problems below the threshold of where we can send conventional forces. And I think that was really the big driving factor for how he approached his job at Southcom, because he said, okay, you know, if I take a look at the entire area of responsibility that has been assigned to me at Southcom, I have everything from the southern border of Mexico all the way down to the tip of South America at Tierra del Fuego. And there is a lot of communist subversion going on. I have to deal with international drug cartels. I have to deal with communist guerrillas in El Salvador. I have to deal with the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. We have an ongoing love-hate relationship with Manuel Noriega. Argentina still hasn't recovered from the Falklands War. We got Augusto Pinochet in Chile, who is ruling that country with an iron fist. 
I got a lot of problems here, but the big thing for me to do is to try to keep the Cubans and the Soviets and the Nicaraguans from spreading their ideology by force. So how do I do that? Well, I can't necessarily pull triggers, but I can train up the indigenous forces to pull the triggers and I can give them all of the tools and all of the tech techniques and tactics that they need in order to uh, establish their own security. So I think in a uh, broader sense, he saw his role as a facilitator and an advisor and saying, if I can keep the lid on all of these um, on all of these anti-communist guerrilla campaigns uh, and uh, you know, keep the lid on it to the point where it doesn't escalate into a uh, high intensity conflict, then I say that I will have earned my paycheck. That all that stuff sounds super complex. Yeah. And you and I both know it's easier said than done. I mean, right. the French and Indian War starts maybe because George Washington <laughs> was a little <laughs> bit crazy. Right. Uh, we recently had Michelle Black, who wrote a great, great, great book called Sacrifice about the Niger uh, Mali ambush of that mm -hmm. Special Forces team, that ODA. And look, that's just you have not enough resources. You push people out. There are people that you're supposed to push out and, yeah. and they ran out of luck. And on that day, it wasn't, it mm -hmm. wasn't the beginning of anything, but just it was a bad day. And so you have all these people trying to train the indigenous forests and doing the whole FID mission, foreign internal defense for anybody listening. Um, you know, those kind of missions where you're out there, that stuff can happen. And that stuff has to happen. I mean, at some point, somebody's going to run into somebody else or get caught too far out. How did he deal with all of, of those problems as well? Because, okay, you're trying to deal with Manuel Noriega, but all these other things, like right. any day, any tr a car accident could ignite a war. These are, these are hot spots. These, they are. Fuel everywhere. Mm -hmm. It sure is. And it was a very delicate balancing act that he did for the better part of three years when he was, uh, when he was in command of Southcom. And there are a few anecdotes that stand out to me. One of them was how he was going to provide assistance to the Peruvian Air Force. And uh, this, this was a, a pretty interesting story in and of itself, because uh, Peru was one of the countries in South America that had an ongoing friendship with both the U.S. and the Soviet Union. So here you have a uh, potential uh, international incident that could be percolating, and you have the Peruvian Air Force that uh, has bought the standard uh, the Soviet attack helicopter. And while they have this uh, Soviet helicopter that's in their inventory, they have purchased some, uh, they've purchased some FLIR night vision devices from, uh, from the US. So when you have a, uh, a night vision device, an airborne night vision device, no less, that is built in America and you have a, a Soviet built helicopter, it's going to take a lot of headwork to sync those two up and adapt an American made system to a uh, to a communist made platform, so the onus then on on uh, Paul Gorman and his team becomes okay. Well, how do we train the Peruvian uh, Air Force pilots and the Peruvian Air Force technicians to properly employ this system without getting caught by any of the Soviet advisors who were dancing around all these Peruvian air bases? Because you know it's going to be uh, it's going to be uh, quite an unpleasant incident, and the fallout is going to be pretty big if it makes headlines that an American air technician was caught by a Soviet advisor inside a Soviet helicopter trying to install an American system in it. So uh, how they worked their way around a lot of situations like that was they had to, uh, they had to um, do a very big intelligence campaign anytime they went into any one of the Latin American partner countries. They had to say, okay, well, what times are the Soviet advisors awake? What times are they asleep? What times are they the most busy throughout the day? What times are they going to enter into their rest cycles? Is there anything that we can do on our end to try and distract the Soviet advisors? Maybe we have a Peruvian mole who says, oh, hey, guys, look over here. I'm having this particular trouble on this particular airfield. Can you please send your advisors to you know, take care of this made up problem? And while they're over there, uh, while, while they're over there trying to deal with that issue, okay, you have an American team over here in this Peruvian hangar who is, you know, doing a Johnny on the spot crash course of how to integrate this American night vision system into a Soviet-made platform. So it was really a game of cloak and dagger, and uh, trying to do everything either while the Soviets were sleeping or while they were otherwise preoccupied. And uh, yeah, that is uh, that very delicate balancing act and how to time those operations just right just right in order to avoid being detected. 
uh, that was a typical day for Gorman's team in Southcom running those black ops. Yeah. I want to go back to Gorman. If you look on Wikipedia, Gorman's entry, there's nothing there. It's yeah. like a paragraph or two. It doesn't it's even fair. have all his awards, you know, right. like it's like, Oh, army commendation medal. Not even like how many Oakley, like no one knows who this dude is. Uh-huh. And yet it seems like he was widely recognized as being a, a fantastic warrior while he, he was. was in the army. Right. Absolutely. He was. What happened? How come, how come he's just so unknown? Well, you know, I think that is a fate that befalls a lot of American generals and a lot of American innovators within the military. You know, you have one or two key personalities who will make headlines in any given year or within any given conflict. But, uh, you know, for every uh, for every handful of American leaders who make headlines in one battle or one conflict or another, you have at least two dozen more who are showing just as much competency and just as much valor and just as much know-how and they are making things happen and having a long-lasting impact on the future of military operations. But, you know, their stories, they, uh, for one reason or another, you know, they just don't get told. And I think that's, uh, I think that's a travesty. And kind of going back to what you were saying earlier about what drives me to write all these stories, a lot of it is what I've just described. You know, if there's somebody out there who has had such a profound impact and nobody knows who they are, I, you know, I, I, in that sense, I take it on as a duty. Okay. I have to get this story out there and I have to let the broader reading public know that this is someone who really deserves to have their story told. As you write all these books, and you're just, I always compliment you on your being prolific, but it is really remarkable how much, like, this is what your job is, right? And so you're like, this is what I do. But there are so many books. At some point, you have to do a big volume history, kind of putting it all together, too, don't you? I mean, because you're not just learning about Paul, you're learning about multi decades of conflict, and then you mm-hmm. have this guy and, and how more. I mean, all these different people. At some point, you're going to have to back off and just do, you know, Guardia's history of American conflict from 1950 to 2000 or something, right? Or... <laughs> now that's a good idea. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm your book agent. I'm like your biggest fan. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but for real though, I mean, do you, do you feel like at some point you'll have to press pause and just write something that kind of puts it all together? Well, you know, I, uh, I've toyed around with a few ideas like that. You know, I, um, I, and I, I, I'm actually toying with the idea at some point in time to um, make contributions to the American military textbooks and, you know, put it within the perspective of how all of these battles are um, part of the broader um, American foreign policy and mm-hmm. how they uh, and how they dovetail into all the different world events that have happened um, from this particular point up until the present day. You know, I think that, uh, you know, if I can put a human element to that, then, yeah, it would be time well spent. When you talk about South America, you're talking about, especially during his era, but, you know, throughout, I mean, our lifetimes, there is a ton of CIA involvement. And anytime the CIA, some of the FBI is there, the DEA, I mean, we still do the cartels there in Mexico now instead. But I mean, whoever who has American command over that area is definitely looking at Mexico going fentanyl's destroying Americans left and right. It's coming from China. It's going in through Mexico, mm-hmm. but what can you do? Like, you're not just going to, I mean, I would, and I want to be careful what I say here. You could put an American brigade on the other side of the river at El Paso and just say, it's not moving until you guys calm the hell down, but who's going to do that? You know? Right. <laughs> Yeah, it uh, it is an incredibly complex environment, and uh, yeah, it's um, it's one that has the potential for a lot of political backlash. You know, I mean, yeah, I I am not one to think that politics and political backlash should dictate the course of what American military operations should be. I think yeah. that uh, the overall objective should be security and doing what's right for the country. But uh, yeah, I, Pete, it is pretty much just how you said, you know, you can't put a brigade there in El Paso. As a matter of fact, uh, I was uh, stationed at Fort Bliss uh, right. only a few years ago when all of the uh, when all of the uh, uh, all of what you just talked about was was reaching center mass when we were starting to uh, put actual forces on the border. 
And uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, the uh, JTF North headquarters was was quite literally uh, two blocks from from where my unit was. And yeah, it's uh, it is a problem that is not going away anytime soon. And, and for those that don't understand, it's it's not far. I mean, the border is El Paso and right. to Juarez south of there. It's minutes from bliss, from mm-hmm. <laughs> just minutes. And and so you have this thing, but you sure there's a military base there and that requires some attention from someone who wants to do something adversarial. But you can go 150 miles east on the border in Texas and there'll be nothing. Nothing mm-hmm. out there for, for miles and miles. It's a very complex environment. How does someone like Paul deal with that? Like that? I mean, he, he didn't have Mexican command get command over Mexico, but in general, how does he deal with these problems where and people from his region are are going up through Mexico and infiltrating? I mean, Colombia had I don't know. I mean, we've had a number of drug traffickers on recently, right? These are all problems that a, right. that a commander of that region is like having to announce, you know, like, hey, this is what we're trying to do about this. But again, like, y- you know. <laughs> it's just only so much you can do because you can't just put you can't just put a division in Colombia, right? Yeah. So one of the ways that he tried to combat the problems in Central America was using a, a lot of redundant reconnaissance assets, and uh, you know this is actually something that uh, I learned very on in the military in my education, uh, particularly in the armor cavalry world. We we, we tend to call this redundancy of observation. We try to put as many uh, a passive observation assets on a particular problem at one time that will feed us as, as much real-time information as we can get in order to assess what a threat is and try to make our uh, decisions based off that information. And uh, one of the things that stood out to me, and one of the things that he said was incredibly effective, he said that there were two things, really. He said, one, we had uh, aerial reconnaissance assets at uh, key points, uh, key points throughout each one of the Latin American borders, we had these uh, reconnaissance assets that were patrolling the Pan American Highway, and he said just putting those assets in the air um, made made for a uh, real time observation system that interdicted a lot of uh, uh, interdicted a, lo- a lot of drug traffic, and he said another thing that uh, previous uh, Southcom personnel hadn't really counted on was trying to develop what was called a brown water Navy capability for each of the Latin American countries. And by brown water Navy, we're talking about a Navy that's more of a coast guard in its nature. It's more of a rapidly deployable uh, coast guard that's designed to defend the territorial water, uh, the territorial waters of a particular country, probably from anywhere from like 10 to 500 miles out. He said, when we do that, we will, uh, you know, we will, be able to interdict and disrupt a lot of the Traficante network that's going down there. What other kind of wisdom did he impart on you? Because I'm assuming you guys had some pretty extensive interviews. Oh, we sure did. Sure did. The interview process uh, lasted, I want to say, for a good 14 to 16 months. So, wow. yeah, so there was uh, th- there were so many good stories that he had to share. Um, but, you know, the uh, the thing that really resonates with me more than anything that he told me was that, uh, you know, is that anywhere he was, uh, he, the first thing that he did was look for ways to solve a problem. And he wasn't afraid to think outside the box. He wasn't afraid to step on anyone's toes. Uh, you know, he is the most gifted problem solver of anyone who I have ever spoken to, you know, just the way that he would deconstruct any of the situations that he was confronted with, you know, that's really something that can't be taught. I don't think that's something that you can learn in a classroom. It's either, it's either something that you learn from experience or you just have a, you have a foundational talent for it. And then it grows as, you know, as, as your experience grows. Um, But, you know, just the way that he was able to tackle these problems and the way that he was able to find ways around any of the bureaucratic roadblocks that he was confronted with, I mean that right there is brilliance, and that I think is the uh, that I think is the hallmark of any leader. That problem solving ability again. This is more for the audience than for you. That problem solving ability, especially if you've got four stars in your shoulders, it gets to be hard because you need your people to do that mm-hmm. to present you with a problem that you know. This is a division level problem. This is a major right. command level problem. This is not a battalion level problem. And so how do you provide the solutions as a leader so that, that you can get that solution down to the bottom as quickly and as, as efficiently as possible without micromanaging? Because look, at a general who's above generals, they're so high up in command, it, you know, they really 
they don't pick up a shovel and move dirt. You know, they, they sort of manage that process. Yeah. How does he, how does someone like that do that though? How does he learn to do that from a guy who is, you know, in Korea, you know, probably with a shovel in his hand, helping to dig and, you know, leading by example, and then transitioning to someone who can't lead by example, because you're not supposed to do that work. It's somebody else's job. Right. Well, I think one of the ways that he did that was really empowering his subordinates. You know, he, he said, okay, you know, from my perch here, whether I am a division commander, whether I'm in you know, command of a uh, major geographical combatant command, he said, it's always important on me to gather the best team that I can. That's why, you know, he was, th- th- that's why he was very particular in uh, picking the members of his select staff when he was at Southcom. He said, okay, I'm going to do a by name request for each of these gentlemen. And the reason why I'm picking them out is because I know they br- bring the exact type of experience and the exact type of expertise that I need in order to have a functioning command group. So he reaches out and he says, okay, Bert Otero, you are a guy who is 100% fluent in Spanish. You grew up in Puerto Rico. You have flown combat missions in Vietnam. You are aware of the uh, you know cultural tidings that are dictating each one of these Latin American operations. I want you and my staff. And then he goes off to say, okay, Bert Clover, you are another person that I want to have on my staff because I did time with you when I was doing the operations uh, research and statistical analysis um, work at, uh, at TRADOC. So I know that you have a mind that is geared towards data. I know that you have a mind that is geared toward numbers. This is what I need. And this is how I need you to quantify all of the, uh, all the different operations and metrics that we're going to need in order to make our Southcom operation successful. And he says, okay, well, I need someone who is familiar with seaborne operations. So Paul Malstead, you're gonna be my guy, you're gonna be my Navy inside guy. I need your expertise on how to do these amphibious operations. I need your expertise on how to do any of these uh, shipborne systems that I have in mind. So, so just going through that calculus and that process of vetting all the people that he needed, that he knew he needed in order to make a successful team, uh, that's how he was able to, uh, you know, keep the uh, keep the ball rolling and keep the success going forward of, you know, trying to keep South America as stable and as free from communism as he possibly could. I think it's important to note that he became who he was during a time of joint and combined mm-hmm. uh, military becoming a thing. So, I mean, he had to learn how to do that. What was his, what was his background education wise after, after graduating from college? What, what did he do and what did he write on? Right. So yeah, he, he got a crash course in, in, in joint operations, largely as a function of, of the service school system that uh, that he was put through, you know, when, when he graduated from West Point in 1950, you know, pretty much all he knew at that point was the army, and right. his experiences in Korea were pretty much uh, strictly army experience. There was very little crosstalk or uh, cross loading with any of the sister services. But then you fast forward to 1955, 1956, and he gets thrown uh, into the Marine Corps Junior School which is the equivalent of the captain's course that, uh, that uh, our army officers go through today. And he had virtually, you know, he had virtually no experience with the Marine Corps, had only a very superficial knowledge of how they conducted their operations. But, you know, he got to see how the other half lives and how the other half uh, conceptualizes these concepts of warfare. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, well, you know, it, it's interesting to see how exactly the Marine Corps does it. And what their approach is. Here's how they see amphibious operations. Here's how they see airborne operations. Well, guys, this doesn't exactly dovetail with my experience in the Army, but let me give you my two cents worth so we can have this uh, two way learning experience. And, you know, that gets played for when he, when he goes to the National War College and also when he does a lot of uh, crosstalk with the Navy research labs in trying to uh, bring some technical assets. It, into the army's fold so you know at all these critical junctures throughout the 1950s to the early 1970s he has these cross-pollinating experiences with each of these sister services and they are each teaching him something about how to conduct warfare and they're learning stuff from him at the same time that's um i mean that's 
the idea right there, right? Like right. mix these things in. And then the coalition piece must come in later on. Cause again, you know, Marines, okay. That sounds normal, but a brown water coast guard force being deployed <laughs> a couple of decades later. I mean, we're a long way from there because the coast guard wasn't that force in, in the fifties. And then what about the coalition side trying to bring in, you know, Hey, we have all these, I don't know, French aviators that are going to support our operation that like, he's got to be inventing a lot of this in real time as he's commanding or working on staff for someone who commands a unit that has that capacity. Absolutely. He is, you know, and, uh, as a matter of fact, um, that was, that was one of the things that uh, he touched on with Southcom. He said, you know, uh, one of the things that was really a challenge for us was trying to build up the air force capabilities of all of these Latin American nations, because, when you looked at the overall shape of uh, what these uh, what these um, Latin American air forces were doing, you know, it almost broke your heart because they were decades behind where we think they should have been. You know, if you if you take the Dominican Republic, for instance, you know, in 1979, their air force pilots were still flying P-51 Mustangs, you know, wow. and. You know, and, uh, you know, in in also in places like Panama and also in places like El Salvador, you know, they were were flying these World War Two vintage aircraft Mm -hmm. and they only did one night qualifying flight per year. Wow. (laughs) And that was barely enough to maintain their proficiency. So he said, you know, we did have to invent a lot of it as we went along. We had to uh, we had to invent these night training programs for them. We had to teach them how to, uh, you know, if we couldn't sell them planes directly, we had to uh, we had to arrange some foreign military sales for them. And we had to teach them how to uh, how to adapt their own forces to defend themselves against anything like a Cuban MiG or any type of aggressor aircraft that would, uh, generally speaking, outperform anything that they could throw at it. Right, yeah. right. The book is called Danger Forward. It's about this guy right here, Paul Gorman. And and I love it. It's, and here's the link just to get the book. If you guys go onto Amazon, use that link. You'll, you'll okay. kick back some money for the show. And as always, subscribe. Subscribe to the show on YouTube. Helps me out. I, I wanted to get back into the the thing about Paul because as I'm reading through this book, I realized I was like, okay, that's that's pretty damn cool. Um, I have two part question. Okay. And then just reading through, you're reading through, and at some point I'm like, come on. I mean, like, how many careers did this guy have in his career? It seems like it was like, and then yeah. this completely redefined who he was, and then this incredible thing happened. And like it just the and thens just kept going. So what does he consider the best? I mean, look, anybody who goes into combat, it's going to define a lot of what your career is, but most yeah. of your career is not going to be combat. So what did he think was the pinnacle? Of, of what he did or who he became. And then, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts on how dense his career is with just incredible event after incredible event? Mm-hmm. Okay, well, let's see. I think if I had to zero in, and I think if, if there was one thing that he could point to as the defining moment in his career, I think that would be his service in Vietnam. And uh, that actually includes both combat tours that he served in Vietnam. Because, you know, it was America's most unpopular war to that point, at least. And uh, the uh, public opinion was uh, turning savagely against the war. But, you know, at, at both points within, his, within his, uh, his multiple tours of duty, he was not only to effect positive change, but he was also able to take units that had lower states of morale and turn them into very high performing units while trying to... Uh, get a grasp on a nature of warfare that we had never really considered before. You, you know, th- this was the counterinsurgency environment. This was the environment where the front lines had disappeared and the enemy was elusive and could very well easily be at your front, rear, or on your flanks. So the fact that he was able to motivate those units and inspire them and turn them into high performing outfits while fighting a war that was very unpopular at home against an enemy we had very little experience fighting against, I think uh, really is just nothing short of incredible. And that would probably be one of the things that uh, he would latch on to uh, as being a defining moment in his career. What did he think about the modern wars? Because we're talking about counterinsurgency. We, we tend to believe, at least right now, that they are counterinsurgency type right. fights. But what, right. what are his thoughts? All right. So let's see. You know, uh, that actually dovetails into 
how dense his career was, you know, because he right. says that, uh, you know, he says that one of the one of the problems that the army has traditionally had is that they train very hard to fight the last war and that they tend to look backwards in, in, instead of looking forwards. And he said that, you know, when we wrapped up Vietnam, there was a uh, strong trend in the military to think that counterinsurgency had become passe and that we had to focus exclusively on fighting these high intensity conventional wars, most likely, um, most likely on the plains of Europe. But he said, look, yeah, history really does not bear that assumption out. So what I want to try to do um, when I go forward and I you know, make all of these new training uh, concepts and I make all these uh, new training programs within the training and doctor in command, I want it to be within the framework of saying, OK, let's not just prepare for another high intensity conflict. Let's not forget about counterinsurgency. Let's not forget about training indigenous forces to uh, take on their own security apparatus, because even though Vietnam was unpleasant, it's not outside the realm of possibility that we might find another war like that sometime in the near future. Let's keep our conventional uh, assets strong for sure, but let's not forget that, you know, in the ever-changing nature of warfare, a, uh, you know, um, asymmetric warfare, unconventional fights are uh, going to be part of our future fighting capability whether we like it or not. And, you know, it's also kind of ironic because, you know, in the same breath, he was telling me that he foresaw a, uh, you know, he foresaw a uh, tactical environment that would not only be unconventional, but would also be network centric, that there would be a growing, uh, there, there would be a growing cyber threat capability as modern technology progressed at the pace that it was at the time. Yeah, that's crazy to be predicting a cyber cyber war, and and, and we're I mean we're on the frontier of it now, even though it's well established. And and yeah. where it's going to be in twenty years, it's going to it's going to be crazy. Right. When when you look at someone like Paul, who's who's done all of these incredible things, does it is he kind of Forrest Gumpian, where he ends up in the right place at the right time, or <laughs> was he always like this guy? You know, like you know, in at West Point, was he, you know the adjutant and all these, you know, was he always out in front of his people? Was he always this thinker or how did he become this dude who just gets it and can see the future? Well, you know, I think a lot of it is his natural born intellect. And I also think that, uh, you know, I also think that it was the right combination of being well-prepared, taking initiative and having good luck. Uh, you know, and he wasn't, he wasn't afraid to buck the system and certainly wasn't afraid to bend a few rules in order to accomplish his objectives. Um, one uh, one anecdote that I can provide for all of our viewers out there is uh, exactly how he got to the front lines of Korea. Because you know, back in 1952, he was a young lieutenant fresh out of the uh, infantry officer basic course, and he really wanted to go to Korea. But every single graduating lieutenant in his class ended up on bulk orders to Germany. And he said, Germany is about as far away from the action as you can get. I don't want to go to Germany. I don't want right. to do tours along the Iron Curtain. I want to go where the action is. I want to go to Korea. So he said, okay, very secretively, I'm going to disobey the order. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to put my derriere on a train out to Camp Stoneman in San Francisco. I'm going to show up at Camp Stoneman. And that was the, uh, that, that, that was the primary replacement center for soldiers going in and out of Korea goes up to the adjutant at uh, Camp Stoneman and says, hi, my name is Paul Gorman. Uh, I am supposed to be on orders to Korea. And the adjutant looks at his clipboard and says, huh, Gorman, I don't see your name anywhere on my manifest. Are you, are you sure you have orders to go here? And and Paul Gorman said, yeah, of course I do. You know what? Here, uh, I, I'm going to get on the phone with the Pentagon, the actual personnel office at the Pentagon. And uh, you know, I'll, I'll see what the problem is. I'll have them send my orders over. You know, so it goes to a pay phone or whatever it is picks up the phone, gets on the horn with the chief of personnel at the Pentagon and says, you know, hi, my name is Paul Gorman. I'm here at Camp Stoneman right now. That's where I'm calling you from. I'm supposed to have orders to Korea, but the Camp Stoneman personnel don't have my orders. Can you send them over? And the guy on the other end is thinking to himself, well, gosh, I don't know what could have caused this snafu. Hey, hey, uh, don't even worry about it. We'll send your orders right over. He, uh, he hangs up the phone. Then he goes back over to the adjutant at at Stoneman and says, "Hey, yeah, I just got off the uh, phone with the uh, with the chief of personnel. Uh, they said that they're uh, they said that they're going to send my orders right over." And the adjutant says, "You know, I just got off 
the phone with the, uh, I just got off the phone with the Pentagon too. And they told me the exact same thing. They said, hey, sorry for the slip up, but they're going to get your orders right over. I love it. And, and it wasn't even a week later that he was on the ship to go to the front lines of Korea. And he told me, he said, Mike, you know, the army was probably well aware of what I was doing. They were well aware of this ruse, but you have to remember it was 1952 and it was so rare to find somebody who wanted to go to Korea. No questions were ever asked. Right. So, so. Well, and there's also that thing with the, uh, with the presumptive orders, you know, like, yeah. Hey, you know, I was told, you know, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I showed up uh, similarly unannounced, but on orders, but no one knew because it was during the holiday uh, quiet time at Huachuca. Right. And, and for those that don't know, during uh, in training units and training posts, most of the post is, is half of it is not even working half of the time because, not, <laughs> yeah. because you're not training warriors. And so I showed up and just happened that I showed up on like nobody's here day except for the, uh, the E4 is the specialist. Yeah. And, uh, and it's Christmas break. And so I, I show up and the guy's like, hey, who are you? And I'm like, oh, you know, I'm a specialist turner. I'm here. Here's my orders. And basically, I just had orders that took me to Wachuca, right? No, no pinpoint. And the guy's like, well, and, and Wachuca is my home. It's that's the spy school. So yeah. I went to the headquarters for where I thought I needed to be. And he's like, yeah, OK. And this is an E4 talking to an E4. He's like, here's what I'm going to do. I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to assign you to this unit over here because once you're here, no one's going to take you out. Otherwise, guys like you will get assigned to this unit that doesn't do anything. He goes to the field all the time and you don't want to do that. And so he, he snuck me in. <laughs> and the hilarious part was this is this presumptive thing on, on why yeah. this works for a guy like Paul and I. Um, a couple months later, the sergeant major is like, boy, I fought hard to get you here. And I'm like, you were so full of shit. You had no idea I was coming because I wasn't on the gaining roster. They hadn't even yeah. had time because my orders yeah. changed. And then I left on leave to go uh -huh. to Machuca. So uh -huh. those things, those things, I think the, it is if someone had commented, how would that happen today? That's my buddy yeah. Dick. Um, that can absolutely happen today. Like someone's like, oh shit, I, you know, let me fix this. And yeah, uh -huh. they fixed the problem that they don't realize isn't really a problem. It's pretty funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things I loved about, about the book is later on, you know, and he's this asset and I look, people must know who he is because like he had his guys, he must've been someone's guy because he kept getting like call phone. Hey, by the way, you're going to go whatever in this case to the CIA. Mm -hmm. Which was, I love that story about how he found out about it from a German paper. Right. And, and he's like, what? And then the guy, his boss calls him and he's like, hey, and you know, totally right. Like if uh, in the book, yeah. uh, Mike tells the story about how he finds out that he's in the CIA now. He's still in the army, but he's going to be like a, an army attachment. And, and he's like, how come I didn't find out about this? How come this guy's saying he's calling me? How come we're not doing this via classified channels? All these how comes we're all normal, but how come, how come this guy gets picked for this? And then, yeah, I mean, what a crazy assignment. And he, and he says it's one of his favorite throughout his entire career. It is, it is, you know, um, the army really only looks big from those who are on the outside looking in. Once you get into the army, you really start to realize just how small it is. And I mean, it is a very tight knit community and the higher you rise in the ranks, uh, the more everybody at that level tends to know you, you know, and it, it, uh, it really only goes to show that if you have a solid, you, if, if you have a solid track record of performance, then uh, yeah, as, uh, as all of these task teams tend to pop up, they're like, well, you know, just a few years back, I was in Vietnam with this one fellow, his name was Gorman. And I got to tell you, this is a brilliant tactician. You know, he's a very uh, out of the box thinker. This is the guy that we need to have. Uh, this is the guy that we need to have on the front lines of whatever project is coming up. And uh, yeah, you know, once you get uh, once you get past the 0506 level, uh, that's really how a lot of those assignments tend to play out. I've noticed because, you know, I mean, have, having uh, served in a brigade headquarters myself, there is a uh, there. It becomes more a function of who knows who and who can point to whatever accomplishment is in your ORB. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that with that is, is, is he's not really serving a full tour in a lot of these cases then he mm -hmm. just gets tasked like so much for orders he goes to the new place he goes to the cia and it's like and then he gets there and i love this he's like well there's nothing for me to do here i guess i'll just <laughs> write yeah. some papers or whatever what and that's also the army right like we have this important role and you get right. there and you're like uh here's your office have a nice day you know yeah <laughs> yeah it's like go read a field manual so 
<laughs> yeah, but I mean, what what was his job then at the CIA? I mean, I know he wrote those papers, uh, but right. but what was his job ultimately? Like, what did he invent for himself? Well, so on paper, his his, his job was to be a military advisor to the CIA, and uh, you know he was supposed to uh, advise uh, CIA operatives and decision makers on what important military taskings and what important military affairs were going to be uh, were going to be affecting the course of American involvement wherever the CIA was going to be uh, sending its personnel either for you know, intelligence gathering operations or what have you. So he was supposed to be the uh, all resource um, all resource advisor in that regard. But you know as he said in practice what it ended up what he ended up doing was sitting in his very nice corner office and Writing papers about you know whatever uh, important topics there were on national security, uh, the papers that were so well put together. As a matter of fact, that he was uh, given a literary award, two literary awards <laughs> by by the CIA, That's and right. <laughs> and you know it, it's ironic because you know I, I and I will never forget when he told me the story because you know it, it uh, the first thing that came to my mind was oh my god that is so like any government job. I mean, it, you know, it, that, that is like stereotypical federal government. You know, they give you an award and then a friend of a friend of a friend tells something to the inspector general and says, oh, well, you know, uh, we appreciate your hard work, but that's actually against regulation subparagraph three of, you know, subsection A or whatever. And you actually can't get that award. It was given to you, you know, it was given to you in, uh, in, in, in violation of, of, uh, of whatever regulation. And Paul says, what? He says, yeah, because you weren't actually assigned to the CIA. And he says, no, I was assigned to the CIA. I still got a copy of my orders right here, buddy. I had an office. I had my derriere in the seat and yeah. I was working for the CIA. But they said, no, it's actually a technicality. You weren't assigned to the CIA. You were detailed to the CIA and you actually belong to the Department of Defense. So you can't accept this award and you have to give back your prize money. Yeah, <laughs> He's just saying, Okay, uh, I, I guess I can give it back. You know, I mean, how, you know, I mean, how are we going to do this? You know, are you, you're going to have to, you're going to have to uh, uh, take it out of my paycheck or something. And uh, yeah, sure enough, that's what happened. But uh, yeah, you know, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was such a big facepalm moment for Paul Gorman. And again, the, the only thing that kept resonating in my head as, uh, you know, as I was having that story related to me was, oh my God, that is like federal government 101, you know? snafus that are you know, invented out of thin air because of you know some silly bureaucratic you yeah. know interpretation of you know whatever reg is buried somewhere <laughs> yeah and meanwhile like whatever that prize was let's say it's twenty thousand dollars whatever it is yeah. meanwhile right next to that where that happens there's someone literally just throwing 80 grand into the ocean over and over right again. Mm -hmm. something like i remember we had um someone had so it's very common in, in Iraq for us to bring a thing called the re, uh, the radio in a box, the rehab out. And we would use that to try to stabilize the region through radio. And it was a, a common program. So every unit would think they invented it and they would bring the rehab. We got to bring out the rehab and they would order it and then it would disappear. Like, we don't know what happened to it. It was stolen. So it was totally fine. And no one cared if it was stolen because that's war. Mm -hmm. But if you said, hey, this thing's working, let's just give it to the Iraqis and let that governor use that to govern. They're like, whoa, that's Title IX money. You're like, oh, well, then someone stole it. It's gone. And they're like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you could absolutely have someone steal it. Nobody cares. No one's going to investigate it. It's just written off. But if you give it to your partnered nation ally, you know, it's like, no, that, yeah. that, that's the kind of thing that Paul experienced with that award. Which, uh -huh. by the way, tell him the rate of repayment that he had to do. Oh, yeah. So uh, his rate of repayment was he had to take $10 out of his paycheck every month until all of the prize money was paid back. <laughs> yeah. $10 a month over like a course of 36 months. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so ridiculous. Yeah. And this is literally, it cost them more money to investigate this than it right. did. They just said, you know what? Never mind. Don't worry yeah. about it. Yeah. Well, you know, and if, if no one presses charges, you're not in trouble. So <laughs> I guess <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Uh, you get to know these people really well. I mean, hours and hours of interviews. Right. What, what sticks with you about Paul? Well, really, 
what st- what stuck with me the most was just how incredibly down to earth he is. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, um, all of these uh, all, all all of these heroes that I've interviewed, um, all of these people who have uh, who have, have done great things for the country, uh, you know, who have really proven themselves to be uh, to be warrior scholars and to really rise to the occasion when the chips are down. At the end of the day, you know, they are just the most down to earth people that you could ever hope to speak to. You know, they uh, they're they're all very pleasant. Uh, they they all have uh, they all have um, families that they're very close to. Uh, they are incredibly dedicated to uh, you know to to their uh, to their wives, uh, to their husbands, to their children. You know, you really get a sense that you know, hey, these are these are the good Americans. These are the type of people that we really need to be celebrating. And uh, you know, it, it has been an incredible pleasure uh, for me for you know any one of the uh, in, any one of the remarkable people that I've interviewed. Whether it's been Hal Moore, whether it's been Don Blackburn, uh, whether it's been H.R. McMaster or Paul Gorman, is that at the end of the day, they are folks just like you and me, and they are regular. They're they're just regular, good old fashioned American guys who you know want to uh, want to build good memories with their family. One of the things that strikes me about Paul when in reading through the book was. Um, People like him don't often survive their career, not because he wasn't excellent at what he did, but because mm-hmm. he, you know, he didn't say, let's get to the fold of gap with a bunch of lurse guys and tanks, <laughs> you know, like he would do other things. Yeah. And that often puts you on the outs with, with the institution as a whole. Right. How did he, how did he walk? Like, it's one thing to do that and retire as a Colonel. Okay. Like yeah. that, not that crazy. Okay. Um, but how did he do that and continue to get stars on his shoulder? Right. So, uh, I think a lot of it boiled down to two things. One is that he had a track record of producing good results every time he bucked the system. It's like, you know, one of the things that uh, I think uh, that I, I think saved him was that you can't argue with success. He said, yeah, I may have thought outside the box. I may have gone a little bit beyond the bounds of what was deemed to be acceptable protocol at the time. But by God, you cannot argue with the downstream effects of what I've produced. Right. So when he has those uh, qualitative accomplishments that he can point to, and the fact that he has that he has guys like Sid Barry and Bill DePew in his corner saying, "Hey, this is the guy who can get stuff done. Give him free reign of what he needs to do in order to solve the problem." Yeah, I think that right there is the perfect storm that uh, you know overrides a lot of the institutional reticence, if you will, to you know say, "Oh, well, you know, if this guy is not doing everything to a T." the way the book answer says he should, then, you know, his name is mud and yeah, let's just show him the door. Well, and a lot of guys who are just as capable as Paul mm-hmm. don't make it, don't make it across that tightrope because right. those guys often are given jobs where like, gosh, who are we going to get for this impossible job? Mm-hmm. And sometimes impossible jobs remain impossible, you know, and, and you're right. not able to do it. So what, how much luck is in his success too? Because again, like I know all kinds of kernels are to like, right. And then this thing happened out of my control, and that was my career. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, I I think a lot of times it does boil down to luck. You know, because you know, I I I mean, I can even tell you from my own experience. You know, when I entered the armor officer basic course as a young lieutenant, I had so many capable lieutenants on my left and on my right, and uh, you know, these were all very talented men. You know, these were all guys who were really dedicated. They were really gung ho about the mission. And, you know, for one reason or another, you know, they either elected to leave the military or they just found themselves in a unit that was uh, hamstrung by toxic leadership. And for one reason or another, they, uh, you know, they they didn't continue on in their careers for those reasons. And I think of my original class, uh, less than half of those uh, less than half of those young officers are still on active duty. And, you know, it's not always a function of uh, how smart you are, how capable you are. But when you take that uh, intelligence, you take that capability, you take that tenacity, and you put it in the circumstances where both luck and uh, a luck and happenstance are in your favor, then yeah, you uh, have a person who's in the right place at the right time to affect all those positive changes. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's just one of those one of those philosophical things that uh, I think uh, any number of PhDs would have a field day with discussing. But uh, yeah, it, it's. Uh, uh, a lot of it that uh, that I have witnessed, it's always it's always a combination of two things. It's mm. uh, grit, determined, or excuse me, it's a combination of three things: grit, determination, and intelligence. 
when those three things meet luck, you yeah. have a successful career on your hand. Yeah, it's funny. I was thinking today when I was thinking about what to talk to you about, you know, about my own career in the military. And, and I wouldn't say I was a good or a bad soldier. I was like an unrealized soldier mm -hmm. where I won every board I sat in front of. I was a max yeah. PT guy, fired expert. You know, I, I studied my ass off correspondence courses. Right? I had a degree. But um, nobody cared in my unit, <laughs> you know. And so you just sit there. And then hey, this when I was getting ready to go, it was like it was time for me either to reenlist or to leave, my commander never called me. Mm. Like too busy, you know. And and it's not a knock on him. It's just that's how it is. He look. He's running a battalion. I'm sure you say uh, a battalion sized company, <laughs> you know, because you have trainers and students. And if you've got a thousand students, ten percent of them require a commander's attention almost every day. Right. You know. Right. So, but but this is the thing, right? And so and, and this is not about me. I'm just illustrating like. You can have someone who's ready to do the next thing mm -hmm. and is capable and hasn't even been fully like pushed forward yet. I mean, I was leaving with the master's degree because no one else in my unit would get one, right? <laughs> and not even a, hey, what can we do to keep you in call? Right. You know, by the time he called, I was like a month out <laughs> from being out of the army. And so the military stinks at this. They, they stink uh -huh. at recognizing like, here's some people that, you know, we should, we spent all this money to train these lieutenants. We don't want them to leave a captain. You know, what do we do? And and I don't know, is that is that just a problem that doesn't need solving because the army can't be too big anyhow? Or what are your thoughts? How do you get better at recognizing and finding more Pauls? Well, you know, I think one of the biggest ways to correct that problem would actually start from the top down. And I say that in the sense that, you know, if we were or if the military collectively were to get better at handling and addressing and rooting out toxic leaders. That would take care, I think, of 95% of the retention problems that the military has, because one of the things that I've written about and one thing that I want to write about more in some of the future projects that I take on is, uh, you know, just how much toxic leadership can get out of control and how for years and even decades on end, uh, the military hasn't done much collectively to address toxic leadership. And, uh, you know, and the toxic leaders that do survive and slip through the cracks don't really have an incentive to change their behavior because those control mechanisms aren't there. Yeah. And, you know, I think that uh, I think that if you uh, if you put more accountability mechanisms in place to say that, OK, if there is a toxic command climate and there is an identified toxic leader, that there is a counseling and a and uh, that there's a counseling process, a rehabilitation process. And a, even a punishment process, if if uh, indeed there needs to be one, that if you put those uh, if you put those systems in place, then that will you know that will take care of a lot of the uh, a lot of the leadership uh, struggles that uh, a lot of these uh, a lot of these um, younger soldiers, officers, and enlisted um, uh, face on a regular basis, because you know it, it was a uh, it was a poll that I read, and for the life of me, I I, I can't remember. Where I read it, it may have been Coffee or Die. It may have been one of those veteran websites, but I don't remember. Uh, it said that a uh, it said that a recent survey indicated that the number one reason that young officers choose to leave the military, and it also goes for young NCOs as well, uh, that that the number one reason they they choose to leave is because they don't feel that the leadership cares. Or that, uh, you know, it, it just has to do with toxic leadership. It's like, you know, why am I being micromanaged? Why are my leaders making mountains out of molehills? Why are they unnecessarily creating drama that doesn't exist? And why do I feel like they lack empathy? So, right. Yeah. <laughs> I want to uh, plug the book one more time, but okay. tell us what's next for you. What are you working on now? Because I know there's another book coming. Oh, yes, sir. As a matter of fact, I got three projects in the hopper as of right now. So let's see. So the first one uh, is is a story called The Combat Diaries, and that is a collection of about two dozen short stories, um, all told from the uh, perspectives of the veterans who lived it. And The Combat Diaries is just a collection of all of these different veteran stories. It uh, runs the gamut from, uh, you know, men who were infantrymen to, uh, you know, men who were pilots or, you know, who were, who were gunners on, um, on a B-17. Um, just some of the personalities that are showing up in this book. Uh, you know, I have the uh, I have the story of uh, one gentleman who was the first officer um, to wade ashore at Omaha Beach. Um, I have another uh, story in there of a uh, of a young uh, of a young naval pilot 
who was uh, flying against the Japanese carriers at Midway. There is a uh, there is also another gentleman who was a B-24 crewman, uh, got shot down over Germany and spent uh, spent the remainder of the war in not one, not two, but three different German BOW camps until VE Day. Wow. So uh, just uh, incredible stories that I'm going to be telling in the combat diaries. And then uh, the follow on project after that is a book called Blood Alley. And it's essentially taking the uh, same construct from the combat diaries, except I'm telling a bunch of different veteran stories from Vietnam. And, uh, you know, you have, uh, again, um, quite quite a few uh, uh, quite a few amazing personalities that are showcased in this book, one of whom uh, I will tell you is a is a particular gentleman named Tom McCullough. And I, the best way to describe him, and again, I don't know if this is the best way to uh, describe him. It's really just the best analogy that I can think of. He's kind of the mirror image of Ron Kovic. Okay, he he was wounded in action in a in a very similar manner to uh, to to what happened to Ron Kovic. But uh, instead of becoming anti-war and you know r- r- writing memoirs like Born on the Fourth of July. Tom McCullough was pro-war all the way uh, all, all the way through the end of the conflict. Attended pro-war rallies as a wounded veteran, and despite the fact that he was wounded, um, you know he, you know he he got married, had a family, and he he uh, he later became the president of the Boys and Girls Club. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow. So that's a lot of good stories. Yeah, a lot of good stories, and those World War II stories just keep coming out. When you were describing these guys. I, you know, in finding my new family, I found out that my uh, grandfather flew Hellcats in, yeah. in the Pacific, which is uh, how cool was that? And then right. uh, one of his brothers flew, I think, I believe it's B-24s over Europe. And then okay. the other one was in the Navy and went to like Iwo Jima and all these other things. Uh, so, yeah, there's this. And, and no one knows these stories. Right? They, right. No one told them, right? These are still untold. And then I thought about, have you ever heard of Henry Longuerre? Does sound familiar? He's oh, he wrote the most incredible book uh, with Jim D. Felice, and he jumped in. You know the, the, the longest yard, uh, the longest day, not the longest yard, the longest, yeah. the longest day uh, when the guy hits the uh, steeple of the church and it's red buttons, and he's up there just kind of hanging around. Yeah. Well, one of the guys that jumps in right next that really happened. One of the guys that jumped in right right next to that guy was Henry, uh-huh. and in his life for the next eighteen months is a straight up like first person shooter video game. Right. He, uh, he killed tanks. He killed ladies. He he got abducted by the uh, the Germans. I mean, it's insane the stuff wow. that he did. And how he's just this sweet old man. He's like, yeah. I have construction and moved on. You know, <laughs> blows my mind. All right, the movies. The book's called The Danger Forward. It's about a guy named Paul Gorman who was a general who lives this impossible military life. Uh, we talked about the density of his career and everything he did. And that story is told by our good friend Mike Guardia, who. Writes great books. You guys should definitely go to his website. Here it is right Thank here. You, yeah, no worries. MikeWardia.com. Here is the link for the book on Amazon. If you like military history and you want to read something new, Mike is your guy because he tells these incredible stories. And the books are completely like you can just burn right through them in like a, a sitting or three and, and you'll be done. So, Mike, anything in closing? Well, Pete, I just wanted to say... Uh, Again, thank you so much for having me on the show. And yeah, to all the listeners out there and to all the viewers out there as well. Hey, I will catch you guys next time around. Everybody stay safe, stay strong, keep fighting the good fight. All right, stand by.